No one person owns this. Everyone shares it. Sharing is caring. It can be fun. It feels good. Just like this children's song makes you feel good about sharing. Sharing is caring. It can be fun. <laughs> and when I asked, what's better, public or private? Most people said, well, obviously public. If it were private, they'd probably charge you a fee for looking. Wouldn't you say public? Otherwise, we wouldn't be here right now, right? But wait, is that true? Supermarkets are private, so are churches. But both are more accessible to the public than, say, public schools. Also, public sometimes isn't very nice. What comes to mind when you hear the words public toilet? Oh, well, that's oh, gross. Those are that's that's gross. gross. Yes, this is the image I have of public toilets. And my town's public parks, including this one, used to look gross too. Garbage everywhere. Buildings covered with graffiti. Fields bare of grass. Sharing is not necessarily caring. Sharing can mean neglect. But then, why is this park now so nice? Because it's under new management. Private management. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. That's interesting. But that goes against what people expect. This is actually a privately managed park. Really? I did notice last week when I was here, they have awesome toilets. Yes, even the toilets are better. Great toilet, because they clean it very nicely. Because when you own something, you take care of it. When no one owns it, nobody takes care of it. Nobody washes a rental car. People destroy other common property, like much of the world's rainforests. American settlers nearly killed all the buffalo. Now we're overfishing the oceans. When everyone owns a resource, no one really cares about it. No one really takes care of it. It's called the tragedy of the commons. And that's our show tonight. And now, the man who shatters conventional wisdom, John Stossel. We like the idea of sharing, communal property, but it does lead to what economists call the tragedy of the commons. It's a tragedy because nasty things happen when everyone owns something. I first heard that phrase in a story about some shepherds who lived around a grassy area they called a commons. Since all the shepherds shared this free green grass, they grabbed as much of it as possible. They kept breeding sheep and bringing many more sheep to graze, but soon, all the grass was gone. The sheep died, and the shepherds had nothing. So then they divided the commons into parcels. Now each shepherd owned one. Each had an incentive to limit the number of sheep that grazed on his grass. Prosperity happened, and everyone lived happily ever after. Okay, it's not quite that simple usually, but we should think about this today on Thanksgiving. This week, school children were taught it's a day of sharing. The pilgrims and the Indians shared the fruits of the harvest, but that misses the point. I assume most of their teachers don't even know that thanks to sharing, the pilgrims almost starved. George Mason University economist Russ Roberts knows the real Thanksgiving story, so Russ, what's the real story? Well, there's an important lesson we learned from the pilgrims, which was when they first came to this country, they thought it'd be nice to share, so they had communal property, they had a big area that they farmed, and their idea was... The corporation actually ordered them to share. Yeah, we're going to work on this together, and then we'll divvy it up equally. Well, that first winter was pretty harsh, and it was cold, and a lot of them got sick. They were in a new place, but they also didn't grow much food. They didn't grow much food for two reasons. One was, if everybody's working together, there's a tendency to shirk. You say, well, let the other guy do it, I'll still get my share. Similarly, on the other end, when the stuff grew and the harvest came, some people poached. They picked the fruit, it was corn in this case, typically, they picked the corn early thinking, I'll get a whole ear of corn if I pick it and keep it at myself in the middle of the night, otherwise I'm sharing it with everybody else. I want to grab my share before the other guys yeah, get Yeah, and get a bigger share overall as a result. So their productivity in that first year was atrocious, and Governor Bradford realized this immediately after he saw what happened, that the incentives were wrong. Governor Bradford wrote in his diary, what must they do so they might not languish thus in misery? Now, your turn. What'd they so, do? So what they did is, they, what Governor Bradford did is he imposed the right kind of incentives on the system, which is to say, if you produce it, you get to keep it. It's really the essence of capitalism. You work hard, you produce something, it's yours. If you shirk and you're lazy, you don't get much to keep. And in Bradford's words, 
they should set corn every man for his own particular and so assign every family a parcel of land. And this simple change took them from near starvation to enough plenty to invite the Indians in and say, let's share. I don't think they were celebrating Thanksgiving because they'd realized that capitalism works and communal property is a failure. I think they're just happy to be alive. And I'm sure they shared with the Indians because they were probably good people to get along with. Nothing wrong with sharing. The real lesson here is what is the role of incentives? And in private property as opposed to communal property, the incentives for hard work and stewardship to take care of the land and use it productively are there. With communal property, it's very weak. Just owning your own stuff makes you work harder to take care of it. It's not really a surprise. Yeah, the incentives are there for, as I said, to, to protect it. But it just sounds wrong to people. It has this, the instinct is to say that's selfish. We want equality. We want government to take care of the important things. Well, there's a place where communal property works pretty well, and that's my family and yours. In a family situation, because we all know each other, the there's a, it's much harder to shirk. It's hard to get away with it. And usually, not always, but usually we like each other. And so I don't mind working for the other person if it's somebody I love and care about. So my wife and I don't have a shirking problem. I'm a little problem with the garbage. She occasionally complains about it. But in general, home life small is communal, small group. If we're people who interact with each other constantly, we're going to have social norms and conventions and all kinds of ways to make sure that people do the right thing. When you get into a larger setting, that's where communal property struggles and typically fails. And the great economist Hayek understood that we have this natural urge to take the socialism of the family and expand it out to the society. Because as you say, what could be better than that? Let's take this love here and make it wider. But we aren't built that way. When we tend to spread it wider, we tend to take advantage of each other, and we le it leads to tyranny, actually. Well, let's look at the rainforest. I yeah. don't think of that as tyranny, but we keep hearing they're destroying the rainforest. Yeah, they are, because the rainforest is public property, and as a result, if you let a tree grow larger to the height it should be, if it's on your land, you capture that benefit for yourself in the form of more wood. But if you're in a public land where you don't, can't control who's going to come after you, you can't fence it in, it's not yours to claim and take care of, the next person who comes in cuts down that tree that you decided to bypass and they capture it. Everybody has that incentive and as a result, the rainforest gets butchered. And if it were, to, and in America, people own sections of forest yep. and the government owns forest. Yep. And there are more forest fires on the government owned forest, the privately owned forest, people have more incentive to take care of their wood. To plant it. more and to not cut it down early. That's the biggest problem with, with, proper, with common property. We see it with the pilgrims. They pick the corn early. We see it with fishing. You keep a small fish rather than throwing it back if it's not your pond. If it's an ocean, you throw it back, you throw it back. someone else is going to get it. Why should you throw it back? Keep it now. If it's your pond, let it grow to the, high, to the size that it should grow. But if it's publicly owned, you, you worry about the other poacher coming in and taking it. So you take it now as well. And then, so I can understand how fish farming, private ownership of the fish, would work in some inland area, but I can't see how you do it with the ocean. Well, the ocean's got a, a couple issues. With migrating fish, you can't really own the property. You, you, could, you could own the fish. You could have a certain uh, tagged fish, potentially, with electronic surveillance and other technologies. But the way that they're solving that problem with oceans is with tuna. They're building these enormous pens that are, it's a fish farm in the ocean. It's saltwater, briny fish, and they're somewhat free. They're not free-range tuna. They're kind of caged in, but it's kind of a big cage. They get the natural exercise that makes the fish healthier and tastier. And that's one way that technology is helping convert a public area into something private with the appropriate incentives. You say traffic would go faster if we had private roads. Rush hour comes from the fact that there's no incentive for the owner of the road, which is all of us, it's a beautiful thing, but the owner of the road has no incentive to maximize its productivity. And as a result, we all get stuck in traffic and complain a lot. Finally, animals, endangered animals. What should we do about that? And bear in mind that we are on Thanksgiving. Sure. There's no turkey shortage. Yeah, you know, it's an amazing thing. Some animals are scarce and some animals are plentiful. We worry about animals going extinct. We worry about endangered species. Now, here's the puzzle. If you wanted to save an animal, would you encourage people to eat it or not eat it? I well, you'd think. Don't eat it. Don't eat it. Eating makes one less. But if you can make a profit from eating it, that creates the incentive. And if you can privatize the ownership, that creates an incentive to take care of it and grow them. 
And so as a result, uh, there's plenty of turkeys, plenty of chickens, and uh, other animals are scarce because there's no incentive, unfortunately, to take care of them. So both humans and hawks eat chickens, but the more hawks, the fewer chickens. The more humans, the more chickens. Yeah, that was an insight of Henry George, uh, our early economist. And he understood that, that this nature red in tooth and claw, that when more hawks, they eat the chickens, they're just going to deplete the population if they get too numerous. But if we get numerous, more chickens. It's, that is the power of because incentives. We protect and the, chickens, we breed chickens, we, breed we make chickens. sure we've got plenty of chickens. And there's a profit to be made from growing them and taking care of them and making them healthy and eating them. If we made it illegal to sell chickens... They'd, we'd be in trouble. Profit saves things. Thank you, Russ Roberts from George Mason University. Coming up, these animals are endangered too. What's the best way to save them? Kill them. That's right, let's kill them. Look at those buffalo roam. Bison are a great example of the tragedy of the commons. 30 million of them once roamed in America. But because no one owned them, or rather everyone owned them, Indians and the white settlers kept hunting them until they were nearly extinct. The buffalo herd went from 30 million to 1,000. But now, good news, they've made a comeback, all because now people own them. Brian Yablonski is here to help explain what happened. What happened? Well, uh, property rights were established over the very few remaining bison that were left. Uh, when the bison got down to about 1,000, there were some cattle ranchers who were entrepreneurial enough to figure out that uh, the bison were worth more alive than dead at that point. And so they went out to the Great Plains and gathered the few remnants of what was left, about 10, 15 bison, and grew them into the herds that uh, today have made, led to the bison's comeback. They protected them for their own profit they found a way to make the bison pay. Uh, the bison market for them was meat. Uh, they uh, sold bison to circuses, to zoos, and to public preserves. And before that, when there were 30 million bison, at first, no, there weren't enough Indians who killed them. They were doing okay. And the white settlers couldn't really get west to kill enough to endanger them. Right, you had a commons without access to it. And right after the Civil War, when the Transcontinental Railroad was built, all of a sudden you could get hunters, hunters into the plains and you could get the bison back to the markets in the east and overseas. That's when the real tragedy occurred. And some people just shot them from the trains for sport. Yeah, it was wanton waste. Uh, they weren't even collecting the bison. They were just shooting them for fun. Um, all right, so now we've saved the bison. What about the elephants in Africa? Well, some of the same concepts used to save the bison have been used to save elephants in Zimbabwe. What essentially has been done is they provided ownership interest uh, to villagers in Zimbabwe, and that is helping to save them. Prior to that, you had communal lands uh, in Zimbabwe. The villagers you had the government saying, don't kill the elephants. This is don't kill the elephants. The villagers were growing crops, put livestock on those communal lands, and the elephants were coming through and destroying those crops, and other wildlife was running off their livestock. The villagers didn't have any interest in protecting wildlife. They so were when the poachers liability. came, they would just look the other way. They, <laughs> Go ahead, kill the... They would look the other way. Then what happened is uh, villagers were allowed to start getting proceeds from trophy hunts and from uh, safari tourism that came through there. And all of a sudden, the wildlife became an asset. They hired their own game wardens. Uh, wildlife habitat actually doubled because now the wildlife was a, was a benefit to the villagers. And as a result, the elephant population also doubled over a period of 13 years. And why do you know about this? You're with PERC, the stands for? Property and Environment Research Center which is based in Bozeman, Montana, and Beautiful you folks Bozeman. study areas where private property can help protect animals? Absolutely. We believe that ownership provides the best incentives for conservation. And most of the buffalo now are owned by private ranchers, but there are still some in state parks, or one state park, and, and one has a roundup. One has a roundup, and they're actually treating their bison most like private ranchers are treating their bison. They're making their bison pay. And what they do is once a year, uh, for 45 years, they have this huge roundup where they bring in their 1,500 bison and uh, tourists come from all over the world, pay money to watch these bison uh, get herded in sort of an old Wild West fashion with cowboys and cowgirls. 
and the bison come sweeping down the plains, the earth shakes, they get moved into corrals, and then we all go eat bison burgers uh, afterwards. But the point is, uh, the park is making money from the tourism on bison, and then about a month later, they auction off a portion of that bison to private ranchers, and they're also making money that way. All that money goes back into Custer State Park to pay for operations of the park. So the bison are paying their own way in, this, in the case of Custer. More benefit from profit. Thank you, Brian Yablonski. Coming up, how government made the Indians poor and how private property made America rich. If you ever been to an Indian reservation? If you have, you probably saw serious poverty and alcoholism and drug abuse. Is it because there's something about Indians that makes them lazy or irresponsible? No. When Indians own their own land, they do about as well as other Americans. Manny Jules wants to see more of that. He was chief of the Kamloops Indian Band in Canada for 16 years. Manny, why are so many Indians so poor? Uh, well, first of all, John, nobody chooses poverty. One of the things that's happened is we've been legislated out of the economy by the federal governments, both in the United States and Canada. What do you mean they've been taking care of you? That sounds like the best deal. It, well, th by taking care of us, that means providing social welfare programs. The only way to break the cycle of poverty, I believe, is by the recognition that every other Canadian and American takes for granted, and that's real property rights. So in Canada, as in much of the U.S., reserves the, are, are owned by the government. Yes. So the Indian has some piece of paper that says, this is my lot. But underlying that title is the fact that in Canada, the federal government owns the land. So you can't borrow against it. You, you can't, can't borrow, you can't get a mortgage, you can't be bonded. There's nothing that you can have that'll... Be, allow you to be able to go to the bank on your own without the minister co-signing that loan. Uh, let's bring another guest from PERC, uh, economist Terry Anderson into this. Terry, you find Indians do much better when they own their own land. Yes, John. I uh, first got interested in this subject in 1976 when I visited a, a member of the Flathead Indian Reservation. And while uh, visiting his house, I, I noted just how well off he was. He was not in poverty, and I asked, how do you explain this? And I'll never forget him leaning across the table, uh, resting his chin on his hand and elbow, saying, I own this place. And that was my first introduction to the fact that many uh, reservations in the United States do have some fee simple land, that is privately owned land like you and I own our houses. And uh, the Indians that have privately owned land do much, much better. Their land is way more productive than the land that is overseen by the federal government, held in 40 trust. Forty to ninety percent said, more productive, you found. Yes, the, 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 the statistics are just astounding. I've done a lot of uh, gathering of those data, and they show that, uh, that fee simple lands are anywhere from 40 to 90 percent more productive. Uh, than the, the lands held in trust. And as Manny said, uh, these Indians who have their land under the trusteeship of the federal government can't borrow against them. Uh, they are, are really locked into a poverty cycle as a result. It is pretty amazing that no group has been more taken care of by big government than the Indians, and no group in America has done worse. Uh, well, th fundamentally, the, the, the root of the problem is the fact that we don't have the same property rights as others take for granted. And that has to fundamentally change. We have to be able to recognize the collective ownership by the tribe or the band and free the imagination of the individual entrepreneur. We've had economies that went back many, many millennia and were successful until 1492. And Terry, you found that, that Indians had a form of, prover of, of property rights before white settlers came here and messed that up. Before, before contact with whites, Indians were, were very much aware of markets and trading and property rights. Uh, some Indians actually owned the salmon streams. They managed those streams so that they let the larger salmon go up to spawn 
And the result is that even today, those streams have larger salmon than the streams that were held in a commons, uh, owned by everyone and hence managed by no one. The clan, not an individual Indian, but a clan would own the stream. And why today would they still have more salmon? That just goes back to, to what was superior management uh, uh, over a century ago. And, and at the same time, I should note, we are mismanaging our salmon stocks by chasing them around the ocean, uh, open ocean and uh, over-harvesting salmon and many other fish species. We could learn from what the Native Americans uh, uh, did to husband their resources. And you say you can see the private property difference just by driving through some Indian land. Oh, it's, it's fascinating to drive through a reservation in the West. Uh, recently, uh, I drove through the Crow Indian Reservation in South Central Montana, and when you would come to a fence line and on one side see overgrazing, a few uh, scrawny cattle, uh, maybe, maybe a house, and if so, not a very uh, uh, livable house, right next door you would see cultivated fields, irrigation systems, beautiful barn, home, and so on and you don't even need to look at the property records to know that the productive one is held in private and the other one is held uh, in common, in trust by the federal government. Indians on both sides of the road, but private property on one. And you can even see it from the exactly. Google Maps, the, the difference. You can see it from the Google Maps. It's, it's fascinating to just Google a reservation, the Blackfeet Reservation, the Crow yeah, here, Reservation. Here's Blackfeet, there's not much development, very few farms. Here's one where they have private property rights. You can see the same thing on Manny's reserves, where they have managed to develop an industrial park. They're creating jobs, creating wealth, and uh, at least getting uh, one foot up the ladder out of poverty. Manny, I'll give you the last word on this. Yeah, well, th what we have to do is reverse uh, 500 years of colonization, put First Nations, Indian tribes in the driver's seat. We can be, be successful where the federal and governments in both countries have failed. And the only way that that ultimately can be resolved is by granting us the right to be able to own our own lands. Thank you, Terry Anderson. Thank you, Manny Jules. Coming up, we return to my local park. Why is it so nice when so many parks are a mess? But next, how clever ways to mark property help make America rich. Now, I want to introduce you to one of the most impressive people I know. I first met him maybe 15 years ago. It was one of those lunches with some economist from South America. I had some ideas about solving poverty. I go to lunches like that because it bugs me that America is so rich. Well, most of the world is poor, and the world hasn't figured out a way to give them what it was that gave us the power to prosper. So I go to the lunch. I'm skeptical. but. There sits Hernando de Soto of the Institute for Liberty and Democracy. It's a think tank based in Peru. And he starts pulling these pictures out of his briefcase. The pictures show slum dwellings built on top of each other, much like this. And de Soto went on to explain, well, I'll let you explain it. What, what do these pictures show? These pictures show that roughly about 4 billion people in the world actually build their homes and own their businesses outside the legal system, so it's all haphazard and disorganized. But because of the lack of rule of law, the precision, the definition of who owns what, and because they don't have addresses, can't get the credit, can't get what all you mean they don't things. have addresses? Well, to get an address, somebody's got to recognize that that's where you live. That means that there's legal recognition. Legal recognition means property. When you've got property, you know, you've got mailing addresses. And when you make a deal with someone, you can be identified. At the end, the first characteristic, the second characteristic of identity is your address. You go anywhere, they say, what's your name? And the second thing is, where do you live? Until property is defined by law, uh, they can't get into the kind of deals or the division of labor which is cooperation with other people to specialize and create wealth because that's what makes you wealthy the fact that you don't have to milk a cow every day you don't have to work your land every day you don't have to build your own house you can stick to doing a TV program or you can do this part of a Blackberry and the whole market puts it together these guys can't they've got to do their whole building take care of it and they can't specialize and that's the reason of their poverty the day that they get titled the day that 
the businesses in their homes, the sewing machines, the cotton gins, whatever it is they've got there, the car repair shop, finally gets recognized, they can start expanding. They can start using scale. But they need to be recognized by someone, local authority, who says this is yours. They need to work within the law. The Many law, of these places barely have law. That's right. So they take a risk. They're, they just work a deal with the guy on the first floor and they build their house on the second floor? That's right. Probably the guy on the first floor who had the guts to squat and make a deal with someone from government who decided to look the other way has got an invisible property right. You know, it's not very different from when you Americans started going west all the way to California. Like, for example, the California gold rush. The land didn't belong to them. Hey, the country didn't belong to them. It was Mexico. But you went in there, you put 800 mining claims association, 3 million Americans, big guns. And after a while, you decided, why keep on shooting at each other? So between 1848, say 1856, and the beginning of the 20th century, you went out, created a private property system that brought in banks, and you created prosperity. But California really got rich, and the rest of the world hasn't. What's the difference? Because you Americans at that time were absolutely conscious of what the rule of law was about. And as people kept on moving from the East Coast to the West Coast, Washington, George Washington, your first president, called them banditti. You bandits don't have a right to be there. And Congress came around and said, oh, yes, they do. And you started awarding property on the basis of improvements. We didn't always have deeds in America before deeds and rule of law. American settlers worked out their own generally accepted rights to property. So in certain areas of the United States, they had tomahawk rights, which meant those areas where you shaved off uh, part of a tree, probably somebody else shaved part of the same tree to indicate that they had accepted it. Uh, in some cases where they grew corn, for example, the corn grew from here to there, and that established a right from here to there. So those were actually called corn rights. It was an improvement on the land that uh, gave you the title to it because you had worked it. China is still developing such property rights. But in much of the countryside, the past prevails and the land is owned collectively. The whole notion of property rights has been pretty alien to formerly socialist countries because right from the beginning, Marx said it in the 19th century, property is theft. But compare the countryside to cities like Shanghai. I visited Shanghai about 30 years ago, and none of these buildings existed at that time. It's incredible what happens when you just change the rules of the game. What should the rules of the game be? The rules of the game have to say and recognize who really owns what, because how you relate to the assets you have determines how you relate to your neighbor and the rest of the world. We work on paper and plastic, and if you don't have what you own on paper and plastic, you will not be recognized according to standard rules and you can't play the game. This idea of a deed protecting property seems simple, but it's very powerful, it allows all this commerce between total strangers that wouldn't happen uh, otherwise, it applies to more than just skyscrapers and factories. We at Fox Business cover stock markets. DeSoto taught me that they only work because of deed-like paperwork that we trust because we have rule of law. What I'm trading today is, is roughly a thousand futures contracts. That represents about 40,000 head of cattle. I never see this cattle. I actually have never been outside of Chicago to the West to see where these animals are. In the United States and Western Europe, your documents go to the market and practically work for you and think for you. In the developing countries and most of the former Soviet Union, the majority of people actually have to bring their animals to market. People in the developing world have cattle, land, and houses the same way they do in the Western world. What is missing is the rule of law. And you say, if they just had rule of law, they'd be as rich as we? Oh yes, of course. But let me tell you, bringing in the rule of law is no easy thing. You're trying it now in Iraq, you ain't getting there. You're trying in uh, Afghanistan, you're not getting there. You started your work in Peru, uh, working, trying to establish property rights there. The, you were an economic advisor to the president, and you reformed permit laws to the extent that other countries now invite you to go to, uh, you've gone to Russia, Libya, you met with Gaddafi. Mm -hmm. 
uh, 23 countries, Egypt, Honduras, Philippines. So the leaders of these countries, they must get that they're doing something wrong. They get it easier than a North American because you see, the people who brought in the rule of law and property rights into the United States were in the 18th and 19th century. They were your great, 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 great granddaddies. You can't remember that. But in the case of these guys, they see that they're poor relative to your wealth. So it's easier for them to say, where's the difference? They're constantly looking for it so they can recognize it much faster. What we didn't realize over time was that the fact that you could determine that a piece of land went from there to here, you could also do it with a movie script. And you could also do it with an idea, with an invention. And once that there was certainty after who owned what, all of a sudden we started seeing that people trusted the paper more than the object itself because we found through law ways of standardizing it and recognizing it. And on top of that, you built a stock market and you built all that leveraging, which has got you into some kind of trouble now, but without which you wouldn't have gotten where you are today. Property rights gave us the power to prosper. Thank you, Hernando de Soto. Thank you, John. We will be right back. All over America, there are parks that are filthy, dangerous, badly maintained. The governments in charge of them say, what can we do? Budget cuts took our money. We don't have enough for maintenance or security. That's what they say. So do we let the parks rot? Let them become havens for drug dealers, prostitution, violent crime? This park was known for that. And yet, now it's nice. It's Bryant Park, just a few blocks from the studio. What changed it? This man changed it. He's Dan Biederman. He essentially privatized the park. Now he wants to do the same thing to the Boston Common. And that's a terrible idea. It's just Shirley Kressel, a Boston journalist. So, Dan, you first. How'd you save Bryant Park? Well, first, John, you've got to make the park great if it's going to attract private funding. So security, sanitation, horticulture, great lighting, and a lot of programming to draw people into the park at off hours so that it's always safe because the best safety for park is not a tough security force but uh, a lot private, of people in it. Private funding meant you got the businesses around the park to cough up the money. Once the park was great there were four principal sources. The businesses around the park, real estate owners, uh, concessions, events, and sponsorships. And since 1996 we have not asked the city government for a single dollar. Shirley, sounds good to me and the park looks great. What's wrong? Well, there's, the park looks good, but it could be better, and it could be public. Well, what's now, wrong with saying? sucking the money from private businesses, as Dan does? Because or it I'm goes into private pockets. So what? This is because it's very good to use, uh, for Dan, to use the uh, public land for running a private business, a rent-a-park, where, uh, you know, all year round there's commercial revenue from renting it out to businesses. He keeps all that money. People don't realize that. I was in the park yesterday. I walked around. I did a little survey. I asked 20 people if they thought this money was going to the city, and they all think it is. So. But so what if they think it's going to Mars? The park's nice it, and the taxes aren't being hit for it. It wouldn't hit the taxes and the, <laughs> because we have the money left over and the park could be just as good. Well, Shirley, it, it certainly is true that the park is very commercial these days. We were just there. There's lots of buying and selling going on. The day I was there, there must have been a hundred booths selling food and <coughs> holiday gifts. Very commercial. On the other hand, the public seemed fine with that. Well, they've done it up nicely, you know, if it was just uh, ragtag stalls that didn't look very nice, it'd be a different story. They're doing a lot of the things that they should be doing to, you know, make the city some money. Make the city some money. You should, well, you should ask, you should do a, you make know? Make a dance some money. Instead. Yeah, that's right. You should do a little study. You feel and bad about that? If everybody well, would feel just as good about it, they knew where the money was going. It's delightful that the public thinks this is a city-run park. That means it's very public. Nobody has uh, viewed it as privatized. And the final answer to these arguments is every dollar that's earned by concessions and sponsorships and events in Bryant Park goes right back into the park. All of that money is earned in these ways. And the way we can afford to provide private skating, uh, uh, public skating for free, which we do, is from those booths and from a sponsorship from City, which has been very generous, CITI. All right, well, let's talk about your next fight. Let's talk about Boston. The Boston Common was once a common grazing field, a common in the 1600s. It suffered the tragedy of the commons. It was overgrazed. Now it's a park. 
been managed by government for about 400 years. Badly managed, and this is the result. So, Dan, your plans. Well, um, the last thing we want to do is privatize Boston Common. Uh, Boston's not New York. There, uh, it's not as commercial a district. There, John, we are in the position of coming up with ways to greatly augment the city's budget, which everyone involved feels is inadequate. So get the people around the park to pay most of the money. And no, private companies, uh, the Central Park model is a little tougher to... The Central Park model, just for clarity, and I have a bias here, I'm on the board of the charity that helps manage Central Park. I, I joined people because I saw what they did to Central Park. Here are some before and after pictures. When government managed Central Park, it was barren and dangerous. And now it's wonderful. And what the model is that I give money, people are, who live around there just give money. It's not a business arrangement. You're doing some mixture of that in, in Boston is your proposal. Correct, it, it would be a mixture. You can get a lot of money from private sector companies for, from sponsorships where they don't demand a, a billboard. They demand a, almost nothing. You give them a little small plaque of attribution and they will put a lot Shelley, of money into wrong the park. What's well, yeah, we already have the plutocrats and now we're gonna get the corporations the best of both worlds. Uh, first of all, it's not, uh, the point isn't what the size of the, of the billboard is. The problem is that there, we don't need to do this and we don't need to, uh, What's the harm in doing? to teach our next generation of children that the only way they can get a public realm is as the uh, charity ward of uh, rich people and corporations. We can afford our public realm, we're entitled to it, we pay taxes and that's the government's job. Uh, this is not a model. This is not a model. It's a good model. It's not a model. We have to hold our government accountable. I don't know what will happen in the no rest of the country. It's working in Central Park. It's working in his New York City park. Why not try it in Boston? Well, it's, it's working for your corporations, and it's working for your billionaires. It's working for the public. It's not, because they, these people... The money bags get to decide how the park is used and who goes there and who, who are the do they keep out and who the desirables are and who are the undesirables. Who are the who are the undesirables that are kept? Undesirables out? are primarily homeless people, which are always the first thing on the list of how to deal with the homeless people. Want more homeless people in the parks? Well, uh, homeless people have to be somewhere. If we don't if we don't make a system that accommodates people who don't have a place to live, they have to be in the public realm. We, I think, you, we, I think you, unless you can suggest something better, they have to be in the well, public. We have, you, we have, you, you're on 42nd we, Street. We have an answer to that. We have the same number of homeless people in Bryant Park today that we had in, when it was viewed by everyone, including yourself, as horrible in the early 1980s. What we didn't have then and we have now is 4,000 other people. So the ratio of non-homeless to homeless is 4,000 to 13 right. instead of 250 to 13. So any female walking into Bryant Park who might have in the past been concerned about her security now she feels safe. says this doesn't look like a homeless hangout to me. The homeless people are welcomed into Bryant Park if they follow the rules. And those same 13 people are there almost every day. And we, we know well, their names. And, you know, it's uh, nice that you're happy happy your, you have you're, your pet you're, homeless people. You're worried I appreciate about that. protests. You're worried about protests. Yes, that's another major thing. When people get mad at their government, they have to be able to take it to the streets or the parks. And that's one of the most, since time immemorial, the purposes of public space. And a lot of this privatization, and it's true of other parks in Boston, and I'm sure here also, was to stop the uh, rallies and the be-ins and all that, you know, 50,000 people stuff. wanted to protest Bush in Central Park and... We're not allowed. We're not allowed, but yes. they would have killed the grass. What's more important, democratic free speech or the grass? You can replace the grass. Oh, you could it would do take both. two years. It, whatever it would take. It, you well, can, it's you just know, we don't grass. have enough democratic free speech? They can't no. protest on the street? No, this is the place where they would get their proper publicity, where they would get their legitimacy. Where but it they was would, government that said no to them, not corporations. Well, it's the kind of government that is now giving their places over to corporations. That's, that's what the real problem is. What we have to do is fix the government because we're ending up with a two-tier Good luck with that. Dan, system. I'll give you the last word. Quick word on, uh, on events and um, uh, free speech. Uh, the Parks Department writes the permits, so they're the final uh, You don't decider. write them, the, the government writes Parks them. Department does, and will always be the case. And any time it's a politician who wants to demonstrate, we've had obnoxious people on both sides. We had a racist preacher. We had a gay pride demonstration where the language was horrible. Both were permitted because under the First Amendment, we're the agent of the city, and we had to let it be. So we do not abridge any speech in Bryant Park or any park I'm involved in. 
Thank you, Dan Biederman. Thank you, Shirley Kressel. Um, I wish I could say good luck to both of you, but I should only <laughs> say good luck to him. Up next, how can I convince the public that private ownership and management is a good thing? And Shirley, too. Here's a guy who talked about how great the privately run Bryant Park is. But you just said public is better. You got me there. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that sweet? And it reminds me, I'd like to wish you Happy Starvation Day. Well, that is what Thanksgiving would be called if the pilgrims had kept to the communal property rules they started with. When they first settled at Plymouth, they were told, share everything. Share the work. You'll share the harvest. The colony's contract said that it was to be a common. Settlers were to receive their necessaries out of the common stock. There was to be no individual property. The labor of the colony was to be organized according to the different capabilities of the settlers. Sounds like Karl Marx. From each according to his ability, to each according to his need. And that sounds fair. They nearly starved. It's the tragedy of the commons. When people can get the same stuff by working less, they will. Plymouth settlers faked illness rather than work the common property. The harvest was meager, and for two years there was famine. But then they dropped the commons idea. The colony's governor, William Bradford, wrote, they should set corn every man for his own particular, assign to every family a parcel of land. The results were dramatic. This has had very good success. It made all hands very industrious. Much more corn was planted. Instead of famine, plenty. Thanks to private property, they got food. And we have food. Happy Thanksgiving. Be thankful. Now, if only more people realize that it's private property that allows us to have wealth, to create wealth. Some people in the privatized park understood that private ownership does good things. Private ownership or public ownership? Private. Private ownership. I think they run things a lot better than the government does. Yeah, you know, facilities upkeeps are better. Private. Others had to have it explained to them. No, but you Bank. said private was not so good. You got me there. <laughs> the private managers delivered when government didn't. What private property does, as the pilgrims discovered, is connect effort to reward. That creates an incentive for people to care much more and protect things. That's what's protected the elephants in Zimbabwe, the buffalo in the West, and these Atlantic salmon. It's what saved the pilgrims. And then it made America the richest country in the history of the world. If you live in this slum in Egypt and have no deed to your property, you're stuck in poverty. But when you know that your home or your store or whatever you make is safe from confiscation, then you can borrow and take risks and invest. That gives you the power to prosper. And that's the lost lesson of Thanksgiving. So happy Thanksgiving. Go prosper. Have a nice weekend and good night. Catch the post show conversation and get ticket information at johnstossel.com.